video. Kitty, come here. You're in the video now. <laughs> uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So what that means is if you can feel it, then there is a force. So imagine that you were riding like in a really, really smooth car and there was no windows in the car. Actually, you could, I mean, I know when you're in a car, you can feel little bumps, but let's say it was like really, really smooth, okay? So if you were in a car, you actually couldn't tell if you were speeding, if, if you were going fast or you weren't going fast. But if somebody slammed on the brakes, you would get pushed into the front of the car, right? You would feel that change because the brakes had put a force on the car. Likewise, if you're riding in a car and somebody turns the wheel, then your momentum pushes you to the other side of the car. So you can feel it if somebody pushes the brakes or if they turn the wheel. What that means is you could be accelerating for two reasons. One, because you're speeding up and slowing down and one, because you're changing your direction. Let's go over the basic letters that we use uh, when describing motion in space. Uh, R of T represents the position of the particle. And then the first derivative of R represents the velocity of the particle. And then the second derivative of R represents the acceleration of the particle. If you take the velocity and you scale it down by the magnitude of velocity, that gives you t hat, the unit tangent vector. And conceptually, we think of that as meaning the direction that the particle is moving in. I'm using the word direction here and this symbol hat to really drive home the fact that these are objects of magnitude one. There are unit vectors. And then n represents the direction that the particle is turning in. You could imagine a particle moving along this path here. And as it does, I think that it is gradually banking kind of to the right. And you can see that n uh, is pointing to the right. And then uh, um, for this part of the path over here, uh, n would be pointing in that direction. Uh, so we think of n as the direction that the particle is turning. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is where the acceleration goes on this graph. I think this example illustrates where the acceleration vector should go. So I put some constants in just so that the computer draws the graph at a reasonable scale. But essentially the formula is x is cosine t squared and y is sine t squared. So remember that t squared grows more rapidly for larger values of t. So I think this particle should move around the circle faster for larger values of t. Let's have the computer check and see if that does in fact happen. So. Um, the black arrow represents the velocity. You can see I have here velocity vector selected. And uh, as I scrub through the motion, the velocity vector is getting longer and longer and longer. And actually, uh, as it goes around to the other side of the circle, it gets really long. This is, you're going pretty fast if you're riding in this car. Um, so I'll have it just animated here and we can actually watch it happen live. So you can see that the, the black dot is moving faster and faster and faster, and the black arrow is getting longer and longer and longer. So what does this mean about the acceleration vector? Well, objects in motion tend to stay in motion. So at a point in time, the momentum of the particle is going to carry it forwards along the tangent line in the direction of the velocity. If we're going to have the particle stay on the path, we are going to have to apply some kind of force to cause it to turn and stay on the red path. And since uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration, that, mean the, that means the, the particle must be accelerating um, towards the inside of the circle. So let's just check this and see if the computer agrees with me. So I'm going to show the acceleration vector. And you can already see the little green arrow there. Um, it, this particle is accelerating forwards along the path. And then as I scrub forwards in time, um, there it is. Some, some of the acceleration of this particle 
comes from uh, the particle moving faster and faster around the circle, and some of the acceleration comes from uh, the particle. There has to be a force on the particle to keep it on that red path. Um, so that, that's what we're here to talk about, how much of the acceleration comes from speeding up and slowing down, and how much of it comes from turning. Um, in this example, um, these two things are variable. I think this is kind of interesting. Right now, it, it kind of seems like it's about 50-50. I mean, right now, it seems like, the based on the green arrow, most of the acceleration is pointing in the same direction as uh, the particle is moving. So that means that, that most of this acceleration is coming from speeding up. And then as we go further and further and further in time, you can see that when the particle is going very fast, it would actually take a lot of force in order to turn the particle and have it stay on the, uh, the red curve. And then as we scrub even more forwards in time over here, it's actually quite a bit, right? I mean, look how long that green arrow is. It would, when you have a particle that's moving really, really fast, it takes a lot of force in order to uh, have it stay on that same circle. So, I mean, you know, this is math class. How, is there some way that we can calculate these quantities? Suppose that we're in a similar situation. The particle is turning to stay on the path and is also accelerating forward. So um, I'm going to draw the acceleration vector here. Now, what we want to do is figure out how much of this uh, vector, the acceleration vector comes from turning and how much of it comes from speeding up and slowing down. So what I need to do is just decompose this into uh, the tangential part and the normal part of acceleration. So this right here, this distance right here, I'm going to call a sub n. It's a scalar, whatever this length is. And uh, the longer that value is, the more of the acceleration comes from turning. So, uh, and likewise, I can also project this vector over here and I will get another length. And the longer that this length is, the more of the acceleration comes from speeding up or slowing down. So in the end, this length right here is a sub n. These are both scalars, they're just constants. And this length right there is a sub t. Um, so we'll, we'll name them a sub n. I'll do t first, I like that better, makes more sense. A sub t, you know, you don't have to put the hat here, but I'm gonna put the little hat. A sub t is called the tangential component of acceleration. And a sub n is called the normal component of acceleration. So, you know, the, the, their definition does give us a way to calculate them. Um, a sub t is the projection of a onto t. Um, so I can just do a dot t hat. And a sub n is just the projection of a onto n. So I could just calculate a dot n hat. Um, and, and this is their definition. There is a little bit easier way um, to calculate these formulas. Um, we can just use the Pythagorean theorem. So let's look at that now, but, but here are their names um, one more time. A sub t is basically how much of the acceleration comes from speeding up or slowing down, and A sub n is how much of the acceleration comes from turning. Okay, so this is actually pretty obvious. What we're trying to do is calculate how much of the acceleration comes from speeding up or slowing down. So we want to know how much is the speed changing, but the magnitude of the velocity is the speed. So the derivative of the magnitude of the velocity is equal to how much speeding up or slowing down. So that's the change in the speed. But that's exactly what we were trying to calculate with this, with a sub t. So uh, the derivative of the magnitude of the velocity is a sub t. Okay, so that's brilliant because t and n are sometimes kind of a hassle to calculate 
So um, this, we don't have to do that, right? I just have to take one derivative, find its magnitude, take another derivative, and that will give me um, how much the uh, how much of the acceleration comes from speeding up or slowing down. All right, now I need to get a sub n. So let me just draw this picture again and pull out the uh, important information. So basically I've got a right triangle like this. Okay, and this was a, so I'm just concerned about the lengths here. So that means as a length, this is the magnitude of a. And then right here, this length, is um, a sub n, and then this length across this side right here is a sub t, and that makes a right angle because um, t and n are always perpendicular to each other. So by the Pythagorean theorem, this means that the magnitude of the acceleration squared is equal to a sub n, squared plus a sub t squared. Um, so, you know, I mean, we've made it all this way. So uh, a sub n equals, it's always a positive quantity, the square root of the magnitude of a squared minus a sub t squared. So, um, this is brilliant because this gives us a way to calculate a sub n without necessarily having to calculate t and n. Um, so a lot of times if you're you know, in a test situation um, and you're having to calculate these quantities this way um, by calculating the projections is pretty complicated. Um, and also if you're ever writing a computer program to do this, um, these formulas would be much more efficient for the computer to um, work out. So this is our, our usual way of calculating a sub t and a sub n. Let's do an example now. Before I do work out the example, I do just want to look at this really fast. Here is a perfectly circular motion. You can see that this particle doesn't speed up or slow down. All it is doing is turning. And uh, in this example, the acceleration is just pointing straight inwards. Likewise, here's an example of a particle that has only tangential acceleration. So this particle is moving in a, in a straight line. Uh, and then as I animate it, you can see that it does actually speed up. So this particle does have non-zero acceleration, but all of the acceleration is tangential acceleration. Okay, let's calculate the tangential and normal components of acceleration for this curve. Um, so when I look at this, I see that um, the z is the only coordinate that has a t squared. So I am imagining a lot of this acceleration, all of this acceleration, it comes from the z direction. Um, but the, the, uh, the derivative of this is not gonna be a constant. So I do imagine the velocity vector changing. I've got it pulled up in calc plot 3D. So this is our curve. It's kind of a downward facing parabola. Okay, and we're concerned with time one. Um, so I have the whole interval from zero to three. I guess I could go zero to two graphed here. Um, okay, so there in the beginning, actually at time zero, all of, I mean, the, the, the acceleration is always going to come from the Z direction, but right now, all of the acceleration is normal acceleration. All of it comes from turning. And then as we scrub forwards in time, you can see that as the direction that the particle is traveling in begins to um, be more in the downwards direction, then more of this acceleration becomes uh, tangential acceleration and less of it uh, is normal acceleration. So this is true also when you when you throw a ball, um, you know, close to the top, almost uh, all of the acceleration is normal acceleration, but then as the ball starts to arc and it is falling more than it's going forwards, um, then more of the acceleration will be tangential. So, so let's do the calculation. Um, here's the path. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is find the velocity uh, by taking the derivative of the position. 
And now I need to calculate the magnitude of the velocity. Um, to calculate the magnitude, I'm basically just doing a kind of Pythagorean theorem. I got a squared, or I get sort of x squared, so I got 4 plus 1, and then a plus a negative 2t squared, so I got 4t squared. And now the tangential component of acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So now I need to take the derivative of that. So at any time, a sub t will be, okay, so this is like something to the one half power. So I'm gonna start by bringing the two out front and then you subtract one so you get negative one half. So that's gonna put everything in the denominator. And now the chain rule says that I'm gonna have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So when I multiply the, by the derivative of this, I'm gonna need to bring this two out front. So I'll have another two there and then times four t. So these twos are gonna cancel. So I get 4t over the square root of 5 plus 4t squared. Um, brilliant. So this tells me the tangential component of acceleration at any time. And I want to know what it is at time 1. So a sub t at time 1 will be 4 over, okay, so 5 plus 4, because I'm plugging in time 1, so that'll be the square root of, of 9, so uh, I'm getting 4 thirds. That's kind of elegant. Um, now let's calculate uh, a sub n. So in order to do that, I need the magnitude of the acceleration. So let's calculate the acceleration. Remember that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. So here I have the velocity. So now uh, the acceleration vector at any time will be 0, 0, negative 2. So this means that the magnitude of the acceleration will be, I mean, I think you can see that it's just going to be 2, but just, you know, to do the math, I'm going to do the square root of 0 squared plus 0 squared plus negative 2 squared which is two. So uh, brilliant, so this is it, so we're almost done. Now, a sub n will be the square root of the magnitude of a squared, so this is two squared minus a sub t squared, so four thirds squared. So I got the square root of 29th, and this can simplify um, because 20 is divisible by four. So this can be two square root of five over three. So that's it. Uh, a sub t was four thirds, and a sub n was two square root of five over three. Okay, so in the end, um, usually these problems are pretty student friendly. I think really uh, in a test situation, the only thing that you really need to do is make sure that you have this formula under your fingertips, um, which sh shouldn't be so bad because I really think that this one really makes sense that the tangential component of acceleration should be the derivative of the speed. Um, and then a sub n is basically just the uh, the Pythagorean theorem with that. Remember that that in the Pythagorean theorem, a sub n is one of the sides. So be mindful um, that you're going to have to have a negative there. So.